Hello, my name is Craig Jackson. I'm an associate professor of mathematics here at Ohio Wesleyan University. I'm also co-director of this year's Sagan National Colloquium, along with my colleague, Lori Anderson, who's a professor in the Department of Botany and Microbiology. I'll tell you a little bit about the National Colloquium for a second. Uh, the National Colloquium was begun at, o at OWU in 1984, and it was later endowed by OWU alumni, John and Margaret Sagan. Since its inception, the National Colloquium has served as an annual forum to explore issues of international and national significance from multiple educational angles. This year's colloquium brings together internationally recognized artists, writers, activists, and scholars from diverse fields to encourage a broad conversation on current and future impacts of climate change. A central goal of this year's colloquium is to engage the OWU and local community in a conversation on central aspects of this timely and important topic, as well to emphasize the fact that all academic disciplines and divisions, all modes of creative and scholarly inquiry have a stake in addressing the challenges of climate change. I hope your participation in this conversation will leave you with a sense of how addressing these challenges will, will require collaboration and communication across disciplines, cultures, and political boundaries. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Marshall Shepard is a professor in the Department of Geography at the University of Georgia, and he's director of the University of Georgia Atmospheric Sciences Program. He's also the president of the American Meteorological Society, which is the largest and oldest scientific society in the atmospheric sciences. Prior to joining the faculty at the University of Georgia, Dr. Shepard spent 12 years as a research meteorologist in the Earth-Sun Division at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. He also served as deputy project scientist for the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission and is currently a member of the NASA Pre Precipitation Science Team. Dr. Shepard has served as a scientific advisor to a number of governmental and intergovernmental organizations, including NASA, NOAA, the National Science Foundation, the National Academy of Sciences, the Department of Energy, the United Nations World Meteorological Organization, and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Dr. Shepard is a fellow of the American Meteorological Society, and he's a recipient of AMS's Charles Anderson Award for his career contributions in the areas of diversity. Dr. Shepard has also received the Presidential Early Career Award for his use of scientific data, sorry, satellite data to investigate urban hydroclimatological processes. Tonight, Dr. Shepard will speak to us about the other climate change, how cities affect temperature, thunderstorms, and floods. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Marshall Shepard. See, it's, can everyone hear me okay? First of all, I want to thank everyone that I have had the pleasure of interacting with so far today. It's been an awesome time here in central Ohio. Uh, I have to admit the weather is a bit cooler than it is in Georgia right now, so I could take a little warming of the global kind, <laughs> but uh, this is actually quite good to be here and I'm, I'm really enjoying the visit here. Uh, this is really an important time. I've been very impressed with the speaker lineup that you've had here at this uh, colloquium series so far. Many of the colleagues that you've had are people that I know or are personal friends with, and I know they're of the highest caliber. So uh, for those of you that are either affiliated with the university or here in the community, uh, to have a resource like Ohio Wesleyan University to attract such uh, top scholars is, is really of benefit to the community and to the state. So uh, you should really be thankful for this resource because these are literally some of the top people in the field. So what I want to talk about is another aspect of climate tonight, climate change. And I often talk about the other climate change. That is how urban environments, cities that we live in, affect the climate system. And so I often get the question when I'm in certain formats or in certain venues, well, you know, humans can't change climate. Humans can't change weather. Well, let's start off and take a look at this. Tell me if you recognize what I'm showing you. This is data from NASA. As, as you heard, I spent 12 years of my career at NASA as a research scientist developing weather satellites, climate missions to study the Earth. What you he see here clearly is the ozone hole um, as visualized by one of NASA's satellites. 
As we recall, the ozone hole is a result of chlorofluorocarbons from aerosols, refrigerants, and other things that were drifting up into the stratosphere. So there's an example of how human beings can change the climate system. Well, let's take a look at this. Here's a really interesting look at snowfall. If you look on the right, it's the high resolution satellite image. And if you look carefully, you see these little dots with uh, plumes of snow downwind. Those plumes of snow were caused by cooling ponds from power plants. You have relatively warm water that's coming uh, out of the power plant that's being warmed and, and, and it, it's placed in these cooling ponds. You get a prevailing flow over that cooling pond in such a way that just like with the larger lakes and lake effect snow, you get these little plumes of lake effect snow or, or what in this case cooling pond snow. So we were talking as we were walking over here about the ability to create snowfall. Um, if you so desire, you create a large enough pond, warm the water enough, you can create your own snow machine. On the right is actually a radar from the National Weather Service showing those plumes of snow from how the weather radar sees those plumes. So again, the question, can humans change weather and climate? Here's another example. Well, the example that you've been hearing most about here in this lecture series is greenhouse gas warming. So let's take a look at the 1800s up to 2012. And as we progress, this is again data from NASA, from the Goddard Institute of Space Studies. This is a look at the temperature over the last 120 years or so. And some of the things that you see are, are clearly some of the things that you've heard about in this lecture series. As we move forward in time, uh, warming is occurring and it's prefer preferentially occurring at the highest latitudes. Some other things that you'll note is that some of the planet is not warming, some pockets are cooling, but on the average, the planet is warming, and as you'll see as we get to 2012, this image will basically be orange and red, primarily in the uh, northern latitudes. So again, I'm not going to go into this topic in too much detail because you've heard it throughout this lecture series. We, the science is fairly clear, 97% of the climate scientists understand that both human and natural uh, factors are changing our climate. So as a side note, it's always amazing to me, um, you, you heard my bio, I, I have three degrees, uh, a, a PhD, a master's degree, and a bachelor's degree in meteorology, and I study climate, yet I'm still always amazed when I'm walking through the grocery store, or I'm talking to someone in the airport, and I tell them what they do, and they'll immediately come up to me and say, you know, the climate changes naturally. And I said, I don't know how I was made, able to get a degree in this subject without knowing that. So thank you for reminding me of that. Of course it changes naturally. But of, there are also human contributions on top of that change. I wake up every morning and I look at temperature profiles around Atlanta, Georgia. And there's natural variability because of weather. But I also know that, know that there's variability because Atlanta is warmer than the surrounding rural area because of the urban heat island. There's an example of natural and human variability. So I'm, all, I'm a bit baffled why some will try to frame the climate argument as an either or, it's and. There's climate change because of human and natural causes. Well, let's continue our theme of talking about human contributions to climate. Coming a little bit closer to home, oh, by the way, that little image down there, two, uh, 2012, February, I was briefing the Senate and at this moment, the cameraman happened to capture me looking down. I think I was looking at a text from my wife, so I wish someone had uh, warned me to turn my phone off because my wife was saying, the kids are driving me crazy right now. <laughs> but anyhow, so this is a, a topic that has interest nationally and internationally, and, and I guess fortunately or unfortunately, it depends on who I'm talking to, I have to go and talk to, climate, uh, to Congress and uh, some fairly significant stakeholders at times, and it can be a challenge talking about this topic. So let's come a bit closer to home. On the left, here's a weather satellite image of the Midwest, and where you see dark colors, that means warmer temperatures from the satellite perspective. So clearly, you see the Great Lakes, water is warmer. You see some water features in some of the states. But if you look closely, you can pick out some cities too. The urban heat island, the fingerprint of Columbus, of Dayton, and Indianapolis are clearly visible in this satellite image, as little dark hues. That's because to the satellite, it's a locally warmer signature. 
That's the urban heat island. Why do we have urban heat islands? This is actually the most commonly um, uh, uh, public known urban effect on the climate. Cities have asphalt. They have surfaces that hold heat and re-radiate. Cities also have less trees, and so we have less evapotranspirational cooling from those trees. We have a lot of cars and truck engines and air conditioning and heating units which produce heat. That's called anthropogenic heat. These are all factors that cause urban heat islands. And if you look carefully, this is some research from one of my graduate students, Neil Debbage. This is the urban heat island trend for Columbus, Ohio. So it varies, but what you see is that in Neil's research, he's found that Columbus, Ohio, metropolitan uh, statistical area, has the seventh fastest growing urban heat island in the nation. And this is some forthcoming work that he'll publish as a part of his master's thesis as well. So here is an example of how humans have changed the climate. And I can stop here and go home. Because it's the other climate change. People ask me all the time, how can humans change the climate? We do it. We, we, we're well aware of it. Downtown Columbus and surrounding area, this satellite image shows us that we have a warmer heat island because of human processes. So I finally get to my title slide, the other climate change, climate in cities, and I, I modified it a bit. And I have two really interesting images here on this slide. The top left is Hurricane Isaac from a couple of years ago. And you see the cities along the Gulf Coast illuminated. This is from a sat weather satellite uh, called the SUMI NPP satellite. It has a really neat ability to take moonlight and illuminate the cities in such a way that the satellite can see the cities. Of the so you can see this large natural event that will impact a large populous region of the Gulf Coast. This is the warning area for the tornadic event that affected this region on Sunday. So I took the Severe uh, Storm Prediction Center's cone of warning and we placed it on top of urban populations. Point being, that tornado threat that you experienced here in the Midwest this weekend, look at how many major urban environments and how much population was affected. So, Clearly, urban climate and weather processes, there's an important juxtaposition that we need to understand. And that's what I've spent a good portion of the last 15 to 20 years of my research career looking into. I saw this recently. This is, again, from that same SUMI NPP weather satellite. This is the Atlanta area and the surrounding cities of uh, the South. I mean, if you just stare at this, it just, to me, several things come to mind. It looks like a constellation in space, first of all, to me. That's the first thing that comes to mind. But it really shows the interconnectivity and it shows the magnitude of urban land cover. And what we know is these large urban surfaces, they have to have an effect on the weather and climate system in the same way that mountain ranges do or coastlines. They have become forcing functions for our weather and climate. You can see Atlanta, you can move up I-85 up to Charlotte. So these are now major players in our weather and climate system. Look at some of the projections. So this is artificial night sky brightness. Just think of this as light pollution. Late 50s, middle 70s, 1997. Look at by 2025. It's how expansive urban land cover and urban growth will be as projected by the uh, United Nations Population Fund. So urban surfaces will continue to be forcing agents for our weather and climate. So what am I going to talk about today? I'm going to talk about the scale of urban effects. I'm going to show you some examples of urban effects on weather, some examples of urban effects on climate system, and then I'll talk about a new concept that I've been trying to introduce very recently, a forthcoming paper on something called urban climate archipelagos. 
And if you follow the logic, we've talked about urban heat islands. As we start to grow cities, I'm starting to see these archipelagos or chain, but it's more than a heat island. They're, they're affecting many aspects of the climate, as I hope you'll realize tonight after this lecture. So that's why I'm moving forward with this concept of urban climate archipelagos, and I'll have some closing thoughts. So let's, let's start with some basic definitions. I see some students in here. You didn't think a professor was gonna get away without giving you some uh, basic information as a part of this lecture. Let's define climate. Climate is the long-term statistical properties of the atmosphere for an area. So as I was saying tonight at dinner, global warming to me is just one example of climate change because global warming is changes in temperature. Climate change is changes in clouds, temperature, pressure, the frequency and intensity of hurricanes. Climate change is a much broader discourse. Weather describes these on a short term. So the way I like to put this when I'm in places like Congress, so they'll get it, it's like think of weather as your mood and climate as your personality. And the reason I have to frame it that way, because I've been in Congress and I had a guy say, well, Dr. Shepard, it's 28 degrees outside and snowing. What are you guys talking about climate change and global warming? I said, Congressman, it's February. It's winter. So we are still going to have winter and we're still going to have snow in a warmer climate in the year 2080. So we cannot make any claims against or for climate change based on one day. So that's why I say weather is your mood, climate is your personality. I can't tell anything about your personality based on the mood you're in today. So that's how we have to characterize and think about climate. So I always like to use that as a baseline of the definition before I move into the discussion. So now let's talk about how does urbanization affect climate? It's way more than the heat island, but that's what probably many of you had in your mind when you walked in here tonight. And it's certainly an important aspect. Well, this is a paper that I published, and some of the students maybe in here were asked to read this paper, with Karen Sito from Yale, talking about how urban land use trends affect climate. Now, I'm not gonna get into the details of all of these, but urbanization affects heat island and mean temperature, it affects clouds and precipitation, it affects land surface hydrology, floods, it affects the carbon cycle, it affects the nitrogen cycle. So we're gonna kinda of touch on some of these tonight. How many of you have heard of urban dry islands? Raise your hand. At least one person. Why do you know about dry islands? Curious. You've just heard of it? You just, yeah, you, have you heard of dry islands? Oh, you were stretching, okay. <laughs> oh, come on, I've heard that one, I know. <laughs> the, the old stretch after he, he calls you out. <laughs> no. Um, so urban dry islands, cities are heat islands, but we know because they have less vegetation and trees, they tend to be drier also. So look at this recent dew point forecast from one of the major weather forecast models that we use here in the US. Look at Atlanta, it's drier, the dew points are lower. Our models actually are capturing the dry island. That in itself is significant, but it's a totally different talk because our weather models are now starting to pick up some of these urban influences. But dry islands are an example of, that you may not have heard about in terms of how urban environments can affect the climate. So this is just to show that trends in urbanization will increase by the year 2025 or so, 65% of the world's population or more will live in cities. And this left panel tries to show us that. On the right, I just thought this was neat, so I had to include it. This is the urban footprint of major cities around the world, uh, courtesy of Matt Hartzell, who's a geographer who actually lives in China now, US geographer. And I saw this on his blog, and I just thought it was really neat. But what we know about those various urban footprints is that they affect climate from the urban to the local to the regional to the global scale, but then by converse, global scale climate affects down to the local level as well. So there, are, let's take a look at one example of that. So we know about greenhouse gas warming. That's what you've been hearing about all semester. Climate is likely warming because of the introduction of greenhouse gases into our atmosphere. 
On top of that greenhouse effect warming, we know that cities are warmer because of the heat island. But something interesting has been happening in the overall climate change discourse. We as scientists have spent a great deal of time trying to make sure that we weren't including cities in our measurements so that our climate change assessment for the globe wouldn't be biased by the heat island. Because people, some of the skeptic community will say, well, you guys are just measuring the heat island. That's why the climate seems warmer. Lo and behold, because climatologists are pretty smart people too, we were never using those urban stations in our climate records. Although that's one of the zombie theories that I often hear when I talk about climate change. What is a zombie theory? It's one of those theories that, about climate skepticism that just lives on even though they've been refuted in the science for many years. So that's one of those zombie theories about. But what we, in the process of trying to make sure we weren't biasing our global climate record, we were missing something. And what we were missing is that cities are actually warming faster than the rural environments. Brian Stone, a colleague of mine at Georgia Tech, he looked at, he included temperature records in as well. And what we find is that we are missing something important. I just told you that most people are going to live in this world in cities by the year 2025. For the first time in history, we are an urban society. More than half the population lives in cities. And what we're seeing when we actually look at all of the data and not worry about the biases to the global record, cities are warming at the same pay rate as the rural environment, but because you got that heat island on top of it, people in cities are more vulnerable. There's a faster rate of warming and there's a greater rate of warming. Well, let's look at some more evidence. One of the compelling pieces of evidence to me that shows that human beings are having a footprint or an impact on the climate system, people often say, well, how do you know humans are contributing? That figure right there is one reason I know. Well, what do you mean? If our climate was just changing naturally, we should have about an equal number of record high days temperatures as we do record low days in a given year. And that's what we actually saw in 50 years ago or so. Now, we have about twice as many record highs in a given year on average than we do record lows. Now part of that is probably greenhouse gas related, but part of it is the fact that the urban heat island is maximized during the evening and in early morning hours when we tend to get record lows. And so we, because of heat island and greenhouse gas warming, we're not able to get as many record cold nights anymore. So that's why we're seeing a two to one ratio in terms of record highs versus record lows. Now, if it's just a naturally changing system, there should, they should be equal, all else being uh, considered. Another way that cities affect the climate, and this is not rocket science, even though I used to work at NASA, um, pollution. And this is just a look at particulate matter, PM 2.5, and ozone. This is another area uh, that's pretty obvious to people. Cities are more polluted. We get code red days, particularly in Atlanta. You can see, and it looks like, let's see, is Columbus one of these areas in non-attainment? Yep. That means that Columbus, and, and maybe you've come out of it, this is probably a couple of years old, cities that are in red are in non-attainment status with the EPA, which means the EPA has set certain standards for how much particulate matter or ozone or carbon monoxide or sulfate, sulfur dioxide can be emitted over a certain amount of time. If your city is red, it's not meeting those standards. So we all have a fairly good appreciation for the fact that cities cause pollution, humans affecting the climate system. Well, what is this figure? It's carbon dioxide. That's a plot of carbon dioxide for the United States. Where you see red, that's carbon dioxide. So what we find is that cities have carb or carbon domes. They're areas of high concentration of CO2. You can also see it along the arteries, the main roadways. Now that has implications for 
lots of things. Health, urban gardening, food production. Cities are significant sources of CO2. Carbon is a part of the carbon cycle, which is another example of a biogeochemical cycle. Well, can anyone think of another biogeochemical cycle out there other than the carbon cycle? So we know that carbon cycles through the system like water cycles through in a water cycle. Can anybody think of another biogeochemical cycle? Nitrogen cycle. And lo and behold, the urban environments also affect the nitrogen cycle. Every time someone comes and fertilizes the golf course, or your lawn, right? You're affecting the nitrogen cycle. As cities grow, as urban sprawl continues, you have more lawns and golf courses that need to be fertilized. So we're just now starting to investigate and understand what the impacts of urban environments are on the nitrogen cycle, but it exists. And it's an area that really needs future study. So those are some of the key biogeochemical cycles that are affected. Now let's talk about our assault on rainfall. And this is real. This is a, a Chinese official with the Beijing Meteorological Bureau prior to the Olympics, Summer Olympics in Beijing a couple of years ago. If rain clouds are headed towards the Olympic Stadium, we will intercept them. He said, I can't guarantee the ceremony will be dry, but if there's a big rainstorm, I have no way to stop it. The Chinese were placing artillery around Beijing during the Summer Olympics, and they were firing silver iodide into the clouds because the, the theory is they, would, they could actually seed the clouds and make them rain themselves out before they got to Beijing. So that's called weather modification. And it's actually somewhat inconclusive of whether that works or not, but they believe it works. Um, Peer-reviewed literature is somewhat inconclusive. But there is evidence, and I've actually published a lot of this, that should suggest that cities can also affect rainfall, can actually create their, its own rainfall or create its own storms. So let's take a look at how that happens. But before we do that, I have been spending a lot of my time lately answering or posing these types of questions. What if rainfall intensity was increasing in cities even as stormwater management systems were assuming 1950s rainstorms? That's one of the things I've been thinking about. Because one of the reasons I believe we're seeing more urban flooding is because many of our water management systems were designed for 1950s rainstorms, but the peer-reviewed literature tells us that the heaviest rain events now are heavier. The intensity of the heaviest rainfall events are heavier. But many of the cities and the engineered structures were designed under a, an assumption of what we call stationarity. That is, how it rains in 1950 is how it rains in 2013. But the literature suggests that that's not what's happening, so many of those engineered systems are now overwhelmed. What if you could plan cities in such a way that you could strategically determine areas that would receive more or less rainfall. Well, I'll show you some evidence that we're kind of doing that inadvertently already. What if rainfall, snow melt, and other data could be integrated into a smart decision support tool to optimize traffic flow or emergency response? This is what I envision happening as long as we start to understand how urban environments are affecting our climate, but then how we take that information and get it into the stakeholder communities. And then what if I could demonstrate that I could change the regional precipitation climate of a city without discussing greenhouse gases at all? So in other words, I'm about to show you that I can change Houston's climate simply by changing how its urban landscape is configured. Let's take a look at that. So this is a paper I published with colleagues in 2010 in Environment Planning B. What we did is we took a typical weather day in Houston and we ran the model, or we used a weather model to run and predict rainfall. Then we took an urban growth model called Urban Sim 
And we grew Houston to what we expect it to look like in the year 2025. We took that 2025 urban land cover of Houston and put it back in our weather model with the same weather day for contemporary times. And what you get here, this is, this is a plot of the blue and yellow, the difference in rainfall that you get between the 2025 run and the current day run. In other words, you get a different rainfall profile just simply by changing how much land cover is there. And I'll talk a little bit more about how that's done, why that happens in a moment. There's a, a, a large body of peer-reviewed literature, and this is all this is trying to show us. This, these are scientific studies that have been published looking at how cities around the world can modify rainfall or storms. So you can see that this has been observed in many places around the world, and you'll see various places where my name's up there because I've done a lot of this work. So cities can affect rainfall. They can create storms or modify existing storms. Now, this is not one of them, but it's a really cool picture though. <laughs> it's a really cool picture, so I had to show it. This was actually from Denver, Colorado earlier this year. I saw this on Twitter. I tweet, at Dr. Shepard 2013, This is Denver, and this is a super cumulonimbus cloud in the backdrop of the city. I'm, I'm not saying Denver caused that thunderstorm, but I just thought it was a nice juxtaposition of the two. But we do know that cities can affect rainfall and possibly create their own thunderstorms. Well, look at this here. Let's see if we can get this to start. Watch how the clouds clear on this particular day over Chicago. We'll play it a couple of times. There's clearing over Chicago more preferentially because the urban surface is communicating with the atmosphere. And that's going to be a key to how it can also create its own thunderstorms or rainfall. Let's take a look at this. This is a Doppler radar image around Atlanta. I've circled in white the metropolitan Atlanta area. Notice those thunderstorms that are popping up on the southern flank or southern edge of Atlanta. That's what the little yellow and green are. They develop, move down to the southwest, they put out that outflow boundary, that cool air that you feel right before it starts raining. That's called an outflow boundary. But notice where the storms are popping up. Atlanta is causing those thunderstorms, the ones that are starting up in the north. Let me say that again. Atlanta the city is creating those thunderstorms. And I'll tell you why in a moment. And I see this all of the time. Well, not only do we think cities can initiate or cause thunderstorms, a colleague of mine at University of Minnesota, Kenny Blumenfeld, saw me give a, a talk one day, and he said, you know what, I, not only do I, think cities cause thunderstorms, I think they can enhance pre-existing ones. And he sent me this radar image that he had independently collected and some others as well. So this is gonna be a line of thunderstorms moving through Minneapolis, St. Paul. And if you look carefully at what's happening, you've got this squall line of thunderstorms moving through Minneapolis, St. Paul, and they're intensifying as they move over the city. We'll play it again. See how they're, boom, exploding. Now, 10, 15 years ago, I say, eh, I'm not sure what's going on there, but those storms sure got intense. But now we have some idea what may have gone on in that particular event and others just like it. We've published many papers showing this. this is not, I'm not showing you isolated events. Well, let's look at some work that me and a colleague did. This is Georgia, if you, if you know your geography of Georgia. Where you see dark green, that's climatologically a lot of rainfall. So we took seven years of radar data and composited where rain falls in Georgia. What you'll see is that up in the north part of the state, that's where we have our mountains. So we'd expect a lot of rain there because mountains lift the air. Down here in this mid part of the state, down at the bottom, that is where we have 
um, the sea breeze and coastal plain region coming in to get rainfall. But notice around Atlanta, over Atlanta and just downwind of Atlanta, there's more rain. There's nothing climatologically different about the western suburbs of Atlanta. So climatologically, all of this area is the same. And this is the warm season, by the way. We know why this rain is here, and meteorologically we know why. We know why this rain is here, meteorologically we know why. Why is this region and this region more rainy? Because the city of Atlanta is affecting the rain climatology. It is producing and enhancing rainfall and producing this anomaly in rainfall downwind. Well, if you don't believe the rainfall data, let's look at lightning data. On the left is a composite of eight years of lightning data from the Lightning Detection Network. Notice where we see the lightning, in this, in, in, and it's collected in a different way, so it's more discretized. But notice that the eastern part of the Atlanta area and to the east gets more lightning than the western suburbs. Convectively, it's the same processes that would produce the rain. Tony Stalins and colleagues published this work, Stalins et al., 2008, I think. Now, Tony showed me this, and he was all excited about this, the fact that he saw all this lightning over and downwind. But what I saw was something really more interesting. I saw these little things. I said, what the heck is this? What are these pockets of lightning intensity? And what I discovered when I started pulling up maps of Georgia power plants, that they matched up pretty nicely in some instances to where these little anomalies in lightning were. I don't know why. We haven't studied that. But power plants may be also generating more lightning as well. Well, we, here's some more examples. This is a, here's a radar of an event in Houston over here on the left. On the, on the left here, we ran a model and we didn't include any city of Houston. The purple is cloud water. The little lines represent wind. So we're producing sea breeze fronts and we're see seeing rainfall and clouds. When we include Houston in the model as well, we get this really severe thunderstorm that develops that didn't develop when Houston was not included in the model. So another, more examples. So okay, finally let me answer the question. How do cities d do this? Well, there are four hypotheses. One, because cities are warmer, atmospheric destabilization. In other words, cities are warmer, so you get rising air over the city. Two, you have buildings in cities, so when the wind blows in buildings, it's turbulent and it causes the air to rise. Three, cities have lots of particulate, aerosols, which serve as seed. Cloud nuclei. Clouds can't form unless you have some type of particle for them to form on. And then fourth, there's evidence that uh, cities actually cause storms to split. Have, have any of you noticed that anecdotally, that cities approach a big city, uh, storms approach a city and, some, and they tend to split? Some people often tell me that they observe that just you know, in their own. So a warm city actually causes uh, rising motion. How many of you have been to the beach? By show of hand, most all of you have. You notice around three or four o'clock every day it rains at the beach and you get a sea breeze. That is because the land warms up more uh, rapidly than the ocean does. And so you get rising motion over the warmer land, sinking out over the ocean, and the cool breeze comes in from the ocean. Cities are the same. You get rising motion over the cities and that creates lift. Okay. Cities also create lift because of buildings. This was from Panama City, Florida last year. Notice how these condos along the beach are lifting this fog bank. So there's visual evidence that buildings cause the air to rise. So you have unstable atmosphere over cities because it's warmer. The buildings can force the air upward. Polluted cities also create cloud condensation nuclei, which serve as seeds for rainfall. 
We know that we need seeds to get clouds, and you need clouds to get rainfall. So let me show you a really example of this. So how many of you as a kid, come on, admit it, stuck out your tongue and tasted a snowflake at one point? I know you have. I know it. Well, if you had done it in Dodge City, Kansas, back in January 2011, you may have tasted pork or beef. What do I mean by that? Well, on this particular day, the National Weather Service noted, noticed a little strange plume of snowfall falling just to the northwest of Dodge City, Kansas. It was not snowing anywhere else. There was this really narrow plume of snow. This is the satellite image of the snow cover the next day. We, we, we talked about this in a paper we published a couple of years ago. This snow event was caused by a power plant and slaughterhouses seeding clouds upwind of Dodge City, Kansas. That power plant was producing moisture. These slaughterhouses were producing particulate that they could serve as seeds. You were getting the processes that we know we get to, need to get and produce this little plume of snow. So that's essentially another sort of very tangible example of how this works. Now, some people have observed that storms, as they approach a big city like New York or Columbus or Chicago, split. Bob Bornstein and colleagues have published this. Uh, we've published some work with my colleague Dev Yogi at uh, Purdue in 2011, looking at storms in Indianapolis over a 10-year period. We think that storms split when they approach cities sometime. Now, there's physics to explain this. Has any, have, you, have any of you seen anything like this on the internet? This is a satellite image of clouds in the Pacific Ocean. Right here is a little island with a volcano or a mountain. As the flow comes here, it impinges upon this mountain and it creates these von Karman eddies. And we see it in the clouds. I think cities do the same thing. I think they act just like that mountain does and creates these little circulation patterns downwind, von Karman eddies. It's just basic physics. You can create this in a laboratory or you can watch it on a, on a given day if the wind is blowing on a, the corner of a building in some regard. It's a, not the greatest example, actually. So, I hope I've given you some sense for how cities can create or modify rainfall. Now let's think about flooding. Are cities, I'm sorry, are, is flooding becoming more evident? Are we seeing more urban floods? Well, we've seen Calgary in 2013, the Boulder floods, Atlanta 2019, Nashville. There is evidence that we're seeing an uptick in urban flooding. This is a, this is a look at the percent change since 1950 in the top 1% heaviest rainfall events. And this is going to appear in the National Climate Assessment Report that comes out later this year. Every region, and your region uh, is in, the, in one of the higher categories, that means the Midwest region, the top heaviest 1% rain, rainfall events are 45% heavier than they used to be in, in 1950. So that's probably related to the broader climate change. Couple that, as I did in this paper, um, that I published in 2011 with several colleagues. Couple that with the fact that urban environments, when it rains heavily in urban environments, you've got impervious surface. You can't infiltrate into the ground, so it sits there or it runs off, fills up the streams and lakes, they get full, the water has nowhere to go, so you flood the city. So urban environments certainly affect land surface hydrology. I understand that the series next year for this lecture sheet series is going to be dealing with water. One of the big issues in sort of water infrastructure in cities is worrying about floods. Okay, well, what about tornadoes? What about tornadoes? Josh Worman, any of y'all ever watched that show Storm Chasers by the chance? It used to come on. Yeah, Josh Worman was featured in that for a time. Josh says the aerial extent of cities and surrounding densely populated suburbs is growing. 
And it is inevitable that someday a large, intense, long track tornado will impact a densely populated urban or suburban region. If you follow this literature carefully, you know that in the past 30, 40 years, not too many downtown areas, major cities have been hit by tornadoes. And there are theories that because of the urban heat bubble or because of cities and the buildings, that the storms, because of that bifurcation, they split and go around the city. But in more recent times, we have seen more cities that are impacted. Now this is tornado tracks for the United States over the past 56 years. What are some things that just by, just shout it out, that you notice about tornadoes in the U.S.? Hmm? Wider, okay, by the tracks, okay, what else? They don't tend to happen out west. They don't like West Virginia. <laughs> no, you, I'm kidding. They, you just, they're, they're, there's a lot of mountains there, the radar either doesn't see them or people aren't reporting them. So, you see Tornado Alley, there's actually something called Dixie Alley. We've known about it in the South for some time. If you look in Mississippi, Louisiana, and Alabama, you see a high concentration of tornadoes in the South. One of the things that worries me, and this Atlanta land cover image will drive it home, this is 1974, the red is land cover, urban land cover, versus 2005. The dark board is getting bigger. So you now have the probability, as Warman talked about, of more places being impacted by tornadoes when they form. So that's why I believe it feels like more urban areas are now being hit. It's not that we're seeing more tornadoes all of a sudden. The data doesn't bear that out. So by the way, if you hear someone say, see, global warming is causing more tornadoes, dismiss that. Now, I'm firmly in the camp that global warming is real, but people have misutilized certain things. There's no scientific evidence to support that statement. But you'll hear it. You'll also hear people say, well, global warming has caused less tornadoes. Too. There's no good scientific evidence on the link between tornadoes and climate change right now. Okay, what about urban coastal threats? Superstorm Sandy. This is population density. Superstorm Sandy, one of the reasons Sandy was a big problem is that it affected one of the most coastally populous regions in the United States. By the way, Superstorm Sandy was a big deal, right? Would y'all agree? It was. It was barely a hurricane. It was, in the grand scheme of things, a pitily little thing. It wasn't a Category 5 storm. It wasn't a Hurricane Katrina. Uh, Katrina. But because sea level is higher, it doesn't even take a Category 3 storm to cause what Sandy did. And how rare was Sandy? This is a, a paper by Barry Keim and colleagues at Louisiana State showing the recurrence interval. Just look at the red number for the most part. This is the likelihood of a, the number is the likelihood, uh, the return interval in years that a storm will impact that coastline. So look up here where Sandy landfalled. You got numbers like 105 plus, yet, Here's another way to look at it. All these gray lines or hurricanes and that affected the Atlantic Basin over the last 30 years, Sandy was the only one that made a hard left. Very rare event. Media asked me, I mean, I get, I get a lot of media because I'm the president of the American Meteorological Society, was Hurricane Sandy caused by climate change? And the answer that I always give back to the media is that's an ill-posed question. I can't say that Hurricane Sandy was caused by climate change. No more than I can say Barry Bonds 444th home run was caused by steroids. Although I know that steroids were probably increasing the length and number of tornadoes. So a better way of framing that question is that climate change is likely increasing the probability of storms like Sandy. In other words, take a deck of cards. You draw an ace. Every time you draw an ace, you get a sandy. Climate change is like adding an extra ace to the deck. 
That's how I like to frame the discussion, because you cannot pinpoint that climate change caused that storm. You can have that storm, just like the typhoon in the Philippines. You could get, we get typhoons, hello, especially in the, in the warm pool of Pacific Ocean. But we're priming the deck for more storms like that. What we can say about Sandy is that because there was actually eight to 10 inches more sea level than would have been there in 1900 because of climate change, the inundation or surge threat was greater. So there's a, a, there's a, a very definitive sea level traceability to climate change there in Sandy. So again, some little hidden and subtle messages that I'm trying to convey to you in this lecture is that climate change is real, human beings are definitely a part of it, but we've got to be careful how we frame it because we lose credibility when we start saying certain things. So then as I start to kind of wrap it up here, I want to introduce a new concept that I've literally, I've, it's going to be out in a paper call, call on urban climate archipelagos. But before I think about urban climate archipelagos, I had to go back to the literature and um, Jan Goodman's book, Megalopolis. Classic urban, I'm sure my urban geography colleagues are very familiar with this book. He described the urban region from Boston to Washington as one big megalopolis. In contemporary times, the Oxford Dictionary of Geography describes a megalopolis as many, any many-centered multi-city urban area of more than 10 million inhabitants, generally dominated by low-density settlement, complex networks of economic specialization. Now let's take a look at this recent view from a satellite of the lights of the United States. Now, you can look at this many different ways. You can see a bunch of patches of light which represent different cities. But as I started staring at this more, I see many networks of cities, chains of islands, what I'm calling urban climate archipelagos. You can see them in the Northeast, you see them along the I-85 corridor in, in uh, the south from Atlanta through Charlotte, Durham, you see one along the Gulf Coast, these chain of islands, heat islands. But they're not just heat islands, because they affect many aspects of the climate. That's why I didn't call them urban heat archipelagos, I call them urban climate archipelagos. So we've been doing some work on the Boston, I'm sorry, the, the DC, Philadelphia, Baltimore, New York urban archipelago. So I define an urban archipelago as a chain of distinct urban entities with discernible aggregate impacts on at least one segment of the climate system. That is our definition. It's going to be published in Shepard et al. 2014 in Earthzine very soon, hopefully. So what I'm arguing is that when you have a complex network or chain of cities, they pool their resources, so to speak, to impact the climate on a larger scale than just one urban environment would. And we're seeing that in some experiments where we did something similar to what we did in Houston. We simulated a storm in the Baltimore, Washington, Philly area with and without the urban area included. And when we have the urban areas included, we get much more intense rainfall in those storms versus when we take those urban areas out of our model. And so for any of you going off to graduate school, I've actually even created a starter list of research questions because this urban climate archipelago is so new, I literally thought about it as I was commuting home one day because I've been staring at that image and I had to get my thoughts down. My kids weren't happy with me because I promised them I'd come out and play volleyball with them in the yard that day, but I just had to get those thoughts down. So these are some questions that I think need to be answered from the perspective of Urban Clark. These are research questions. What is, what, what are, what really is, I haven't really defined it. I've, I've kind of, I've, I've approached it at a big picture level. But what are the spatio-temporal definitions of urban climate archipelagos? Are there different classes or subdivisions of urban climate? What is the global and regional distribution of urban climate? Does North America have more? Is it tends to be a European thing? Is it an Asian thing? These are all research questions that need, then there are questions related to climate. So here's a, there are at least three or four master's thesis projects and at least three or four dissertation topics right up there on that screen. So in closing, as I was telling someone in lunch today, I'm a scholar, I publish in the scientific literature, but I'm always more interested in how to make this information actionable. How do I take the scholarly information that I have presented 
and present it in a way that practitioners, stakeholders, and policymakers can use them. So last summer, I was on a National Academy of Sciences study that produced a report called Urban Meteorology. You can go on the web and get this report for free, the PDF. And we talked about various ways, and here's the outline of the, of the, of the, the report, it's basically a book. Uh, we talked about ways to take this information and transfer it into the policy and stakeholder arena. And this is important because some research that Benita KC and I have been doing in Georgia where we've been, we've developed a climate vulnerability index and it's beyond the scope of this talk, but we've been mapping out what counties in Georgia are most vulnerable to climate change. And we include things like long-term climate change, extreme events, place-based vulnerability, et cetera. And what you'll see is that from the 1980s up to the 2010s, the places that are most vulnerable are urban counties. So this really tells us that urban environments not only are forcing agents for climate, urban dwellers are vulnerable to climate. So with that, I will stop and perhaps take a few questions. Thank you very much. So if you have questions for Dr. Shepard, uh, go ahead and raise your hand and I'll come around and hold the mic for you. Don't be shy. I, I, this is actually the best part of me, actually. So during your presentation, um, I think you mentioned that uh, urban environments are both more dry and they receive more rainfall. Um, is that correct? Yeah. Is that, OK, could you explain that? Yeah, dry from the standpoint of moisture, water vapor, not rainfall. Okay. So humidity. So they tend to be drier from the standpoint of humidity because they have less trees. So does that clarify it? Yes, thank okay. you. <laughs> Thanks. Other questions? Do you have a theory on why Sandy took the hard left? Oh, not, not only have a theory, we know why. Uh, what happened was we had something called a Greenland blocking high. There was a big high pressure system sitting over Greenland. And just a little basic meteorology 101, in the northern hemisphere, the circulation around big high pressure systems is clockwise. So when you, had a, when you have a high in that position, as those hurricanes, well, I wish I had a, so Greenland is here, right? So there's this big, clockwise circulation around that high. So as those hurricanes are coming up, normally that high is not there. So as those things curve up from the tropics, they then veer back out to sea. Because at the end of the day, hurricanes actually serve a purpose for the Earth, believe it or not. The Earth is always trying to put itself on a heat diet. What do I mean by that? Well, the tropics, get most of its energy, the tropics are warmer than the poles because of the various physical processes, the tropics heat up more than the polar regions of our planet. The Earth doesn't like that, so it's trying to get rid of that excess heat in its midsection and redistribute it to the poles. It does that, that's why we have weather, because those circulations that are trying to redistribute heat currents in the ocean like the Gulf Stream that are warm currents moving out of the tropics to the poles, and hurricanes. They're moving extra heat from the tropics to the poles. And they like to do it and curve out and move on. But because we had that Greenland blocking high, when Sandy came, it got steered by that clockwise circulation left. And so we've got some students actually that have been looking at that, and this Greenland blocking high was quite anomalous, obviously. And they're, they're investigating whether this Greenland blocking high is going to become more common because of melting ice and melting glaciers in Greenland, establishing a pattern that can allow that green, green, Greenland blocking high to exist more than we've seen in the past. Not conclusive on that yet, though. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question? Uh, yes. On, you described several of your model experiments where you, mm -hmm. you uh, ran an atmosphere both with and without 
uh, uh, an a city. atmosphere coupled to a land surface model. Yeah, could could you talk about uh, that land surface model? So in other words, what were the processes you you had that you could turn on and off for I mean, the, for, the, for these, these cities? I mean, the, the big weather models that we use now are fully coupled to the atmosphere, uh, and so. They have land surface characteristics, thermal conductivity, albedo, uh, soil moisture characteristics. We, we, we initialize them with real data from satellites and, and observations. So, I mean, our models are fairly realistic these days. We can actually insert build, uh, cities in, in terms of the impervious land cover, the thermal characteristics of those cities. And so you literally, just you, know, you run the model in your control case with everything in, then you actually go into the model and change the urban parameters to things that look like the surrounding land surface. And that's basically how we do that. So it's, it's, it's actually much easier than it even sounds like because a lot of the, like we use the WARF model, the weather research and forecasting model, which is a, a, one of the main mo weather models used today. And so it's a, it's a very configurable model. And so you can, you can take out the Appalachian Mountains if you want to in the model and see what happens if the mountains aren't there. So. Yeah. What's the resolution of those, though, on, we, on the land in terms of how big of an area can you actually change the parameters of? Well, the mo we run our model at the finest resolution of about one kilometer. So what we have to do is something called a nested grid because we have to start out at a larger resolution, like 32 kilometer grid spacing. By the way, we're getting a little technical talk here, but let me sort of break it down the way I explain it to my wife. We all have like 10 megapixel cameras on our phones now, right? So the more megapixels, the better the resolution of the picture. The more, the, the better the resolution of the model, the finer the resolution of the atmospheric process that we can resolve. So a one kilometer model run means that I can resolve anything that's at least one kilometer in size. So if my model is 30 kilometer resolution, I can't see a cumulus cloud, all right? So the finer the resolution of the model, the more processes I can resolve. So we tend to scale, we, we start out a larger scale and we nest the models down in a telescoping fashion such that at the finest resolution grid centered over the city, it's down at one kilometer. Yeah. You were mentioning that uh, there's no good evidence that there are more frequent tornadoes that can be attributed to climate change. Yes. What's the status of the research on hurricane frequency and intensity with climate change? Good question. So, right. Just to, so you leave out of here knowing, there's a cascade of knowledge on, where, on linkages to certain things in climate change. The most conclusive evidence, or the best understanding that we have is between climate change, heat wave, drought, wildfires, and rainfall intensity. We have pretty good understanding of the relationships there. So when you hear people talking about that, you can have pretty good confidence. We've got moderate understanding of the linkages between climate change and hurricanes, but the best literature suggests that we will see more intense hurricanes when they occur in a warmer climate system, although not necessarily more frequent ones. Now, Carrie Emanuel, a colleague at MIT, recently came forth with a paper suggesting that we also would see more frequent ones, too. But that actually bucks up against the larger body of peer-reviewed literature right now that just focuses on intensity. So the thinking is, and the IPCC says this, too, is that in a future warmer climate, meaning from now forward, in my opinion, because one of the kind of mistakes I think we make in this discussion is we always frame things that it's going to be that way. We're in the midst of climate change. We're experiencing climate events now. I just can't pinpoint exactly what, which one we're just in. a. But one of the things that really resonated with me that I think Kevin Trenberth said is that in a way, everything is affected by climate because even a single, single little cumulus cloud that forms out here now, it formed in a net warmer and more moist climate than it would have formed in 10 years ago. All right? So more intense storms, but not necessarily more of them. And that's because the ocean, the hurricanes feed off of warm ocean water, deep water. So remember, not only is the atmosphere warming, most of the warming is happening in the ocean. So these hurricanes, if they have warm water to tap into, think of it like they're running on 92 octane fuel rather than 89 octane fuel. But that's not all of the story though. Your car needs fuel, 
but if it doesn't have oil or if it has a bad carburetor, it's not going to run either. With a hurricane, yeah, it needs warm water, but if there's a lot of wind shear or if there's some other things that we know that aren't uh, right in the atmosphere, you still won't get a hurricane to form. So it's not just sea surface temperature, but that's an a priori condition. Tornadoes, we have, in fact, you can look at tornado plots of trends, and there is no evidence of any kind of trend at all. So uh, we're still very immature in our understanding of severe weather, although there is forthcoming literature that suggests that the environments that support, would support tornadic-type storms will be enhanced, but we're not at a point where we'll ever be at this point, well, we're not at a point now where we can say for certainty anything about individual tornadic events. So. Yeah, you can yell it. Well, I think they're recording, so you might want to wait on the mic. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for visiting our university. I greatly enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Uh, but my question relates to the climate change mitigation for co coastal urban environments. Would it be more practical to maintain current locations or to completely relocate to less vulnerable positions? Yeah, we were, we were talking about that a little bit. Well, I guess it depends on whether you live in New Orleans or New York, right? Because after Katrina, everybody said, oh, don't relocate, don't rebuild Katrina on New Orleans. But they didn't say that when Sandy obliterated New York and Jersey. I wonder why. I don't know why, actually. But anyhow, um, that's a tough question because at the end of the day, we know that there's going to be another Katrina. We know there's going to be another Sandy. We know it. These people have lived there all their lives. You're getting into human dimension, social, sociology, social science questions. You guys just had tornadoes here this weekend. Uh, do we relocate because we know that tornadoes are going to happen here? That's, it's the same. I mean, it's, it's a tough question. Not sure I know the answer because every place has a threat that may or may not be impacted by climate change. So I think the best that we can do is what maybe the Dutch have done. We start, start instead, you talked about mitigation, but perhaps in those cases we have to start looking more at adaptation strategies. Mitigation is actually reducing the threat because of reductions in CO2 emissions or whatnot. Adapt, and if you want, there's an episode of NOVA that aired just the other week. I was in that episode, it's on the, the mega storm, it was talking about Sandy, and it, they, one aspect of it talked about the, the, the gates and, and, and flood control systems that they have in the Netherlands now. Perhaps we need to think about that. Uh, we know that uh, wetland restoration is very important for shielding coastal communities for hurricanes. So uh, I, I think we have to have a balanced, integrated strategy. I'm not, I personally am not of the, position or in the business of telling people where they need to relocate because I would feel like a hypocrite doing that if I'm not telling people in California they need to relocate because we know they're sitting on the San Andreas Fault, right? So, I mean, that's, that's a tough question, <laughs> but I think you get where I'm coming from. Yep. Good question, though. Well, I still have the microphone, so maybe I'll ask another question. Uh, okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that one of the zombie arguments you discussed uh, in your talk uh, pertains to models and use of models. Mm -hmm. um, and as a, as a user of models yourself, uh, how do you respond to that argument that says, you know, for example, you know, these models are unreliable, they're, 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 they're based on assumptions? Yeah, so the one I get, so by the way, if, if you wanna, I actually have a TEDx talk out there. If you just Google my name and climate zombie theories, you'll find that TED talk. And I lay out these 10 zombie theories that are out there, right? I get them all the time. I mean, I, I was telling someone today, I mean, I am baffled by this, but it happens. I'm sure Michael Mann and others get it too. I mean, you can be like sitting in an airport talking to someone who teaches yoga and they'll sit there and argue with me about climate change as if they know as much about it as I do. So just a quick story, and I promise I'll answer your question. I was in, a, in a, an elevator in Denver at a conference. I walk on the elevator with a couple of colleagues who are talking about climate stuff. And so this guy walks on with us. And he says, oh, you guys talking about climate change? Well, you know the climate's changing because of the sun. It's the sun. I was like, well, yeah, let me hear more about that. So he starts going into this zombie theory that I've heard a million times. 
and that's not credible, by the way. But I let him finish it out, and I said, well, sir, you know, the, this, you know, the sun actually varies on an 11-year cycle. We don't see our climate varying on an 11-year cycle. And actually, for the last several years, we've been in a solar minimum, and yet we're still warming. <laughs> And I said, well, by the way, can, can I read or publish your theory somewhere? He's like, oh, no, I'm an airline pilot. <laughs> I was like, oh, well, I'm sure you do not want me flying your plane. But anyhow, um, to get back to your question, one of the things that we know is that many of our television meteorologists are climate skeptics. I'm the president of the American Meteorological Society. Much bigger organization than TV meteorologists, but that's who most of the public relates to. You see AMS by their first name on TV, that's, that's my organization, we certify them. But a lot of that group, they tend to have a, a less background in climate, but they'll say, get your question, well, how can I trust the climate model? Because I know that a weather model is not good beyond about seven to 10 days. So how can I trust a climate model that's out 80 years? That's an ill-posed question. <laughs> Because a weather model is actually trying to act, predict the atmospheric state four days from now. So the reason I know what the weather is going to be here in, in um, Delaware, Ohio, four days from now, is because there's a weather model that is solving the Navier-Stokes equations and some other physically based equations to predict exactly how the atmosphere is going to look four days from now. I'll give you an analogy. I could put a beach ball up in the Mississippi River near St. Paul, Minnesota. And because I know how fast that river's flowing, I know how deep it is, I know its temperature, I know its boundary conditions, I can write a model equa set of equations to predict exactly where that beach ball will be three days later downstream. Because it's just fluid flow, it's physics. And that's all the atmosphere, that's all a weather model is. But a climate model is not trying to predict the exact state of the atmosphere in 2070. It is predicting a climate state. So it's a completely apples and oranges comparison. It's not even the same comparison. The other thing we know is that when we've run our models in hindcast mode, starting some several years, 100 years ago, and predicting a climate like our climate today, and it does a pretty good job of it, we know that it's pretty credible. So don't believe the hype that climate models, they're actually quite good. There was a time when they weren't, but now our climate models are coupled to the ocean. They have good coupling to the land, ocean, biogeochemical cycles are in there. They do a pretty good job. They're not perfect. They still don't get aerosols very well. We still gotta get the model resolution down, but they're, they're, they're pretty good. So you'll hear one of those, and I'm gonna shut up. You'll hear zombie theories talk about, well, you know, climate models, there's uncertainty in the climate models. How can we trust them? Well, what if I told you there's a 90% chance of rain tomorrow? Would you grab an umbrella? Wasn't there uncertainty in that information? Dr. Shepard, I think your son may have um, the flu. There's uncertainty in that information, but there's a lot of usable information there too. And that's where we are with climate models too. So. Well, please join me in thanking Dr. Thank Marshall you. Shepard again. Thank you. Thank you.